Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It is a pleasure to have you in this Zoom room this afternoon. I'm Eric Feldman, Associate Director of FIU in Washington, DC, and am proud to welcome you to one iteration of our Talent Lab Impact Series. We host these every semester for our current prospective interns and entire university community, focusing on a variety of policy issue areas that we know are vital to understand for DC career success. We recently covered global issues with the Latin American Migration Panel and are excited today to move into the tech world uh, with blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, and we are proud to do this one in collaboration with a DC area partner of ours, because in Washington, we thrive on our governmental and association and advocacy partners. So the Blockchain Association is here with us today, both in uh, uh, one member of the panel and the other members of the panel uh, uh, companies are members of the association. We have a great turnout today so far. So if anyone's new to engaging with FIU in DC, and don't know as much as you should know about what we're all up to here in Washington, we take on three lines of work for the university. Uh, on one hand, uh, we are represent FIU's uh, uh, research solutions uh, before the federal government, making sure that our um, uh, government agency partners and congressional delegation from South Florida are aware of FIU's research strengths and continue to support them. Our idea exchange work is where we host uh, dialogues that are not just student focused uh, like this one, but also um, uh, national dialogue and congressionally focused. We've hosted uh, earlier this month, a congressional briefing on hurricane season, and we're hosting a congressional briefing on Alzheimer's uh, tomorrow. Uh, so these are focused on engaging our government partners and Talent Lab, that's what you're experiencing today. Talent Lab is our student and alumni programs uh, uh, preparing our Panther community for career success. And uh, in addition to events like this, uh, we have three-day fly-in seminars. We have our Hamilton Scholars Internship Semester Program. And I'll be pasting my information and our website in the chat uh, for you to connect with those programs uh, so we can stay in touch. I'm also happy to uh, tout our alumni network here in Washington. In fact, uh, one of the leaders of our DC alumni network, uh, Char Charlie Stack is tuned into the event right now and not only tuned in, but is, is in the other room, came to visit FIU in DC uh, here uh, today and it was great to see him. And so we have a strong alumni network to help uh, uh, engage our students and other alumni in career success. And our, one of our moderators, uh, a DC area alumni as well. If you enjoy this event, we have uh, some, oh, I, the, the slide says tomorrow. By tomorrow, I meant Thursday. So flag that, but I'm gonna put the links for both of these in the chat. Both of these takes place uh, Thursday, a very uh, bipartisan set of events here. We have, uh, we co-sponsor the Florida House Intern Seminar Series. Our friends at Florida House on Capitol Hill, that's our state's embassy in Washington, DC, hosts uh, conversations with different members of Congress from South Florida on Thursday mornings over the summer. This Thursday is uh, Congressman Charlie Crist. I will be there in person at Florida House, so you will see me, but it is hybrid, so you're able to tune in on Zoom as well. And then we are hosting an information session later in the same day for the Heritage Foundation's Young Leaders Internship Program. Uh, we are very proud that one of our uh, a DC alumni runs their internship program and the internship session will, uh, info session will feature another DC area alumna who uh, formerly participated in that program. So I'll paste uh, links for all of that in the chat as well. A little housekeeping um, as we get started here, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Quick note on your FIU affiliation and what, what drew you here today? Do you have goals related to DC tech policy or moving around the country for blockchain jobs? Whatever you want us to know about you. And then we do uh, hand, uh, handle a uh, question and answer a little bit different than some Zoom conversations you might have been uh, in before. Uh, you can chat your questions into the chat at any time. You don't have to wait for Carolina or moderator to necessarily say it's Q&A time. Uh, we might not get to the questions right away, but her and I are both watching for questions. And, uh, and uh, we will call on you to ask your question via video or at least voice. Uh, so that our panelists can see and hear you, but you typing your actual question into the chat is how we know that you have that question. Uh, I'm going to now turn it over to our moderator, proud FIU alumna, Carolina Ramos. She is a, currently a research associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And while she introduces our panel, in addition to all the other things I've promised that I'll put in the chat, I'm going to put uh, the links to the biographies of our panelists into the chat as well. Carolina? 
Thank you, Eric. Thank you for that awesome introduction. I'm so excited to be moderating this panel um, with such phenomenal uh, participants and professionals. I uh, am excited to get started. So first we have a panel on use cases for blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And our panelists are Sochi Casador, head of ecosystem growth at Celo Foundation. And we have Andre Serrano, who is the head of business development for Electric Coin Company. Um, Sochi, Andre, it's great to have you. Great to be here. Hi, Carolina. So Sochi, can you start off and tell me a bit about what you're working on? Yes. Yeah, so um, I uh, lead ecosystem growth at Cello Foundation. Cello's mission um, is to build an open financial system that creates conditions of prosperity for all. Um, Cello is a mobile first um, blockchain platform. And the reason this is important is that we see um, really the market penetration of mobile around the world much higher than we see uh, the penetration or access to financial tools and services. Um, and so this is something that is deeply meaningful for, to, to me. My family is originally from um, a very small town in Mexico that didn't have running water or electricity. Um, and uh, I've seen firsthand how access to basic financial tools can change lives. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Uh, Andre, can you tell us a bit about what you're working on now? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, you know, first, I want to thank FIU and Blockchain Association for having me at this event and for organizing this panel. Uh, so yeah, as Carolina mentioned, I lead business development for Electric Coin Company, and we are the creators of the Zcash cryptocurrency. Uh, I would love to know if anyone here has heard of Zcash or if people are familiar with it. Um, basically, uh, my, I'm responsible for building a high quality ecosystem of companies that are supporting Zcash um, and responsible for uh, managing relationships with all of our partner exchanges, wallets, and custodians. I will also oversee our go-to-market strategy for things like shielded adoption, which are the, the private transactions that, that Zcash has, as well as activity uh, like Zcash in DeFi or decentralized finance. Uh, finally, I oversee our financial inclusion initiative. So we have a program here called Crypto in Context that I am very passionate about. Uh, basically, our mission is to educate uh, underserved communities on crypto and financial literacy, uh, expose people to new opportunities in the digital economy, and to empower people through access to decentralized financial services. Uh, so I'm sure we'll go over a lot about what that means during today's conversation. Uh, but yeah, thanks again for having me here. That all sounds awesome. Uh, so first off, I kind of uh, would like to establish some definitions of, of blockchain. I feel that people tuning into the call are probably familiar with blockchain technology now, but might not be familiar with, let's say, private versus public blockchain systems and, and how that can matter with the work that both of you are doing. Um, Sochi, can you talk a bit to private versus public blockchain systems and how that might affect what you're working on and perhaps give a brief definition for, for either public or private blockchain systems? Yeah, and I'm actually going to turn it over to Andre because I think a lot of the work that Zcash is doing um, fits nicely here. So Andre, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, yeah I am happy to, to kick it off. Um, so Carolina, you know, I inter really interpret this question around um, the difference between open versus public systems or you know, permission versus permissionless systems. So many of the larger, largest blockchain networks today, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, and Celo are all built on open, public, and permissionless networks. So that basically means that anyone is free to participate in the network, uh, run a node to verify transactions and download the software uh, and send and receive uh, using uh, these systems. Um, this idea of permission is really important because permissionless basically means that nobody can be excluded on the, from accessing these systems on the basis of anyone's race ethnicity, gender, or geographic location. Um, it basically means that anyone in the world, whether you're in Nigeria or the Philippines or the South Bronx, has the same access to these sorts of uh, financial applications as someone in an office at Silicon Valley. And so I think this idea of access is really important. 
Uh, on the other hand, permission systems, uh, by definition, uh, basically uh, enable whitelisting for who is allowed to read uh, and uh, write data on the blockchain. And so th there are a few examples of companies that are doing, uh, I think, good work in this space. Uh, Quorum from JP Morgan is one that, that comes to mind uh, that was previously under the JP Morgan umbrella. Now, now they're a part of consensus. Uh, and some of the use cases that we're seeing there are for things like uh, interbank settlement or supply chain. Uh, but I think what's important for me is that, you know, while there's some experimentation happening on the permission side, a lot of the innovation is really happening on the public network side. And I think, um, and thank you, Andre, I think just to add to that, I think what we're also seeing is the importance to bridge the two, right? Um, and so how the two interact with, with one another, I think we're seeing, you know, a lot of interest um, in terms of the private blockchain, specifically from like central banks, right? But I think in order to create this, you know, really rich ecosystem, um, you know, you need to, as Andre was talking about, you need to have the innovation. And I think, um, it's really interesting to kind of think about this concept of like, you know, um, uh, the, the, the private blockchain sort of interacting with, um, with, with the public, right. And how we can make, continue to make things like much more accessible, but really have that interoperability happening between the two chains as well. It's a big, is a big focus that we're, we're looking at with optics. Yeah. So, uh... I mean, both of those uh, descriptions of public versus private and, and the importance of defining those when, when continuing on discussing this, that was great. Um, so back to use cases, Andre, can you talk a bit more about potential use cases for blockchain or, or current use cases for blockchain that we could see now implemented? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> So there's a few use cases that really come to my mind that are driving adoption of blockchain technology today. Uh, so the first one is around digital money. So this one is really important because around the world, billions of people don't have access to fair and open currency. And so uh, you know, networks like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, uh, you know, have started to show uh, properties of being a better form of money. And people are actually starting to use them to store value over time and to transact and, and pay for goods and services. Uh, so this, uh, you know, this first use case of, of digital money, I think, is one that's definitely driving a lot of adoption. Uh, two more that I want to talk about are, uh, the second is decentralized finance. Uh, and so basically what we're seeing is that smart contract applications are able to automate uh, basically every function of the financial services industry today. So we're seeing a lot of uh, projects that are doing work around uh, payments, savings, lending, borrowing, remittance, uh, and even some of like the investment banking functions more like uh, market making, trading and exchange. Um, and so really there's a, a whole range of, of use cases there that are uh, being developed. And the last one that I'll touch on really quickly that I would put in the bucket of around uh, Web 3.0. So this is uh, where I like to think about things like uh, NFTs or non-fungible tokens, uh, decentralized gaming or browsing, uh, different things like that. And uh, I think that we're, we're just really starting to scratch the surface of what's possible there. But, um, you know, at a high level, I think that, you know, NFTs really have the potential to uh, uplift artists and give new opportunities to uh, engage directly with communities. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, maybe Sochi can, can go into more detail about some of the stuff that's happening there um, and we could spend more time on it. But those, those are three of the buckets that uh, really stand out to me. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to build on that. Um, so, um, a lot of the philosophy behind behind Cello and the inspiration from um, of Cello was was really kind of going into emerging markets, right? In countries like Argentina, um, Colombia, um, uh, Kenya, Uganda, um, uh, the Philippines, kind of to name a few, and to really spend time understanding kind of what some of the challenges were that people faced. 
as it related to financial tools and systems. And so we're really kind of deep rooted in this, in this, um, in this, um, in this area of like user, user research and human centered design. Um, I think that, you know, we've been doing um, a lot of work in these countries, and I think what I'm really excited about are some of the use cases that we're seeing emerge. Um, I like to talk about, you know, money is like one of the oldest forms of technology, but we're only now really, you know, seeing, you know, a lot of the innovation with the, with the aspect of not only digital currencies, but programmable money, right? Um, and some of the use cases that I'm like the most proud of is, you know, some of the ones where we're able to give access to someone who wasn't able to access it before. Um, and so we were working with a group of Venezuelan refugees in Colombia to provide them with loans to purchase um, a, basically a motorized bicycle. And so if you think about the context of the world that we're living in today, it's a pandemic, people are still relying on courier services to, you know, order food, et cetera, right? And we really have um, groups of people that are kind of stepping in to like fill some of those needs, um, but a lack access to basic financial tools and services. And so by, by giving this loan, folks were not able to, you know, to not only able to purchase a motorized bicycle, but they were able to double their income and in some cases even quadruple their income you know, um, just by having access to this financial service that wasn't there before. Um, and so those are some of the, you know, some of the use cases that I'm the most um, excited about. You know, I think we think about like a lot of times about this like constellation of services. So it's not just like one in isolation, but how do they work together, right, um, within the community. Um, and I think other examples of that are uh, like micro work, uh, micro work as well. And so again, like in the context of the pandemic, you know, unemployment rates have been like soaring around the world. Um, and so, you know, giving somebody access to technology where they can perform work for a company that's perhaps based in like, you know, in the United States. Um, and receive payment instantaneously for it and not have like the fees, right? Which oftentimes like, you know, erodes a lot of the dollars um, with respect to like cross-border transactions. Uh, I think, you know, that that's another great example of like where crypto is really able to kind of, and blockchain really able to kind of make a difference in, in people's lives, but pro providing them access to money, access to income streams that kind of really help improve their lives overall. Yeah, I guess even just to like touch on to that a little bit, like this, uh, you know, having access to credit is such an important driver of economic mobility. This is what gives people the ability to, you know, go out and start new businesses or um, deal with uncertainty when it co comes up in their lives. And so some of the applications that we're seeing, uh, as I mentioned, in decentralized finance are really exciting for that. So you can go onto an, a platform like Compound or Ape and get a loan without any background check or any credit scores or anything like that. And people aren't able to uh, you know, discriminate or a uh, bias on any of the factors that I mentioned previously. And so having that permissionless finance in the example, whether you're talking about giving loans to people in Venezuela or sending remitt remittance to people in the Philippines, um, you know, this is like a common theme that we're seeing really across the industry. I mean, the use cases for, for blockchain to uplift low income and even immigrant communities within the U.S. is, is boundless. And, and to help uplift those in, in other countries as well through, these technology, through this technology using crypto is, is just phenomenal. I'm excited to see how much the technology develops in this, in this space, though um, I would be uh, remiss to not also acknowledge obstacles to implementation of this technology. Um, so far, I feel everyone it has been uh, hearing about the environmental impact of cryptocurrencies. They've been hearing um, issues with anonymity in regards to black market trading. Um, how can we address these big obstacles to blockchain implementation and ensure that the technology continues to be improved to better serve these broad communities? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to kick it off. Um, so I think like what would be 
amiss here is if we took the same regulatory landscape that exists in traditional finance and apply that apply it to to the blockchain and to um and to digital currencies you know i think it's important for us to kind of understand the ways that they're that they're different right um we're still very much in the early days not too different from like when the internet was what you know was was started um a few um decades ago and so i think this is like this is important for us to understand. I think the other aspect of it is education, right? Um, oftentimes, like when I hear regulator, regulators speak, um, a lot of the challenges that they're trying to address can actually be solved by blockchain and digital currencies. And how do we educate them? You know, we just talked about access to credit. Maxine Waters has been very vocal in Southern California talking about how payday loans, right, are really predatory, right? And it's a challenge in her in her district. Um, and I think, you know, this ability to access capital, right, um, and really kind of have new pathways in life is are some of the stories that we should be telling because unfortunately the stories that you know are told in the media today are you know some of the some of the more the, the negative ones right and i think it's important for us to educate similarly on like the environmental aspect i think there have been a number of comparisons that have been made to traditional forms of money to to to, to block to blockchain as well cello is the first um, carbon negative blockchain. So we actually have a portion of our block rewards that are allocated to, um, to offset um, carbon emissions. Um, but in addition to that, we just partnered with Wrapped and the Soft, Soft Token team to launch um, eBTC, which basically is a form of Bitcoin that, um, that is wrapped on the Solo network where uh, uh, every, for every um, Bitcoin that is, uh, that, is, that is bought, like a piece of it is, uh, is used to automatically offset carbon as well. Um, and I think that's just on the offsetting story, but we're seeing like beautiful also stories emerge where, you know, we have natural backed, um, natural backed assets, right? So we have a project called Moss that is actually, um, you know, uh, tokenizing a portion of the rainforest. Um, and so every time you purchase a, a, a token from them, proceed, like uh, basically a portion of the Amazon is protected. And so I think those, those again, are like some of the stories we want to kind of be able to share and like the goodness that it can do not only for the people, but also for, for our planet. Right. Yeah. Just to add on to that, you know, I think the point about educating regulators and being able to point to positive use cases is so important for our industry. So, you know, some of the work that we're doing in the Bronx, uh, you know, the Bronx is, uh, you know, really full of those sorts of um, you know, more predatory financial services. Many people are forced to use, uh, you know, alternative financial services like payday loans and, and cash checking services. And so, you know, red, uh, starting to educate uh, regulators and local politicians about the role that cryptocurrency can play to help their constituents get access to financial services that aren't predatory, uh, I think is a really important part of the conversation that we as an industry uh, really need to highlight. Um, I'm also really excited about some of the work that Cello is doing around their carbon neutral Bitcoin product. That was a really uh, great development uh, to see launch uh, last week. So that's great. Uh, I just I wanted to touch on like two more things uh, related to the question that that Carolina asked. And so, you know, like by and large, I, I think that there has been a lot of uh, confusion in the way that uh, crypto's uh, environmental concerns are being talked about in the media. And so the first, um, the first I think is around how much Bitcoin like actually consumes. Uh, and so some numbers that I wanted to call out really quickly here. Uh, so Bitcoin consumes 110 terawatt hours per year of energy, uh, and which is less than uh, the amount of uh, energy consumed by always on electronics, like the iPhone or in your pocket or computer, which consume 124 terawatt hours per year. Uh, additionally, it's hard to measure the overall uh, energy consumption of the traditional financial system, but just a couple of data points to put it into perspective. So in the US alone, there are 4,000 banks, 75,000 bank branches, 470,000 ATMs, each of which have their own carbon footprint. And so by estimates that I've seen, Bitcoin uh, is uh, conservatively five times more energy efficient than the existing financial system. So it's important to um, you know, compare it to what you're replacing. But even beyond that, I think it's also 
important, like from a policy perspective, to look at where this energy is energy is coming from. Is it coming from more dirty uh, fossil fuel sources of energy or clean renewable sources of energy? And I think that Bitcoin fundamentally incentivizes people to go out and, and seek out more efficient uh, and cost-effective sources of energy uh, to, in order to be able to receive uh, that mining reward. Um, so hopefully that that can like clear up some of the, the misconceptions that I've seen uh, from the environmental perspective. Uh, and, and the last thing, because Carolina, you brought up privacy, and this is a topic that I think is so important for us to talk about. And um, I think it's important to note that cryptocurrency and blockchain is a neutral technology. And so, you know, I think that we, we don't want to overcorrect for, uh, you know, if stories of one bad person using the technology uh, somewhere. And so, you know, I think especially as crypto has gotten more adoption, uh, governments and corporations are trying to figure out how to uh, regulate the industry. And I think it's important that we stay vigilant about our privacy rights in, in the industry and um, you know, continue to reiterate that privacy isn't something to fear, but should be uh, you know, really embraced by uh, really a fundamental right for, for people and societies. Thank you for, for addressing the, the concerns I brought up, uh, Sochi and Andre. I feel that you uh, address them so eloquently. I would love to continue on um, discussing regulatory actions and, and you both touched upon policy. Um, what regulatory actions in your opinions would either help or, or hinder the industry as it continues to build towards improving the technology uh, uh, for everyone? I'll take that one first, Sochi. Yes, and I apologize in advance. My connection is a little bit unstable, so I got kicked off and I'm back on. Um, so um, I think like hindering, I just, I go back to like what I said an initially. I think if we're applying the same like, you know, f uh, financial policies that exist today to this new form of, of technology dig and digital currency, I think that will hinder innovation, right? And I think we want to kind of figure out like how we are promoting innovation. Um, I think that like helping, you know, I go uh, back to like the, you know, the education, but also like how are we creating sandboxes? I've seen like some really great work, um, I think come from Tennessee and like where some of the states are really, um, really driving innovation. Ben Bartlett from um, uh, um, East Oakland area also has been really kind of like driving innovation in California. And I think that's what I would love to kind of see more of is like, how do we experiment? How do we look at different programs where this can actually solve and address some of the problems that we're seeing either at like the local state or, um, or federal level? Um, and that, that I think is a real, a real big opportunity for us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could not agree more that creating these sorts of regulatory sandboxes where we can experiment with different pro-innovation policy approaches is really important and, and could be a, a good step towards um, you know, designing policy in a way that really helps companies uh, flourish uh, and doesn't really hinder uh, progress in the industry. Uh, along that same vein, I would love to see us um, really starting to remove some of the burdensome legislation that has been passed previously that has prevented millions of people getting access to cryptocurrency. Uh, so for me, legislation like the bit license come to mind, which basically required that uh, companies had to get pre-approval from the New York Department of Financial Services in order to offer uh, crypto related products uh, to New York residents. And so I'm speaking as a New York resident <laughs> um, <laughs> that I think that that has really hindered uh, crypto adoption in the state of New York, and it's meant that uh, millions of New Yorkers have not been able to get access to the most innovative financial products and services. And so to whatever extent we can follow the lead of, you know, people in like the mayor of Miami and Tennessee and, and Oakland, um, and uh, I'm going to continue to do what I can to bring that uh, into the Bronx as well. Wonderful. Thank you both for your insight into that. Um, since we are touching upon policy, I would love to, to loop in um, Jacob, um, who is currently 
working with the Blockchain Association and is the Director of Government Affairs. Um, Jacob. Yeah, happy to join in. Yeah, can you tell me a bit about what you're working on right now? Sure. The, uh, so at the Blockchain Association, we are, our mission is to help companies like uh, Andres and Sochi's uh, engage with regulators and policymakers in Congress and kind of and help them understand the industry better in what is a very kind of confusing and somewhat a foreign kind of environment for many in D.C., who kind of uh, are, 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 are more used to things happening in ways that uh, are more centralized rather than decentralized as the promise goes for blockchain. Um, so basically my job is to answer all the questions that any sort of, that any member of uh, Congress or their staff or regulators might have about the blockchain or cryptocurrency industry. Uh, as you, some of you might've guessed um, since uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain have kind of been in the news more recently uh, in the past few months, that it's also translated to increased interest in Congress. Uh, so currently I've been going around to different um, congressional committees, whether that's on, on areas focused on Homeland Security, tax, uh, banking, or um, even agriculture, um, funnily enough, uh, due to um, Bitcoin status as a commodity. Um, there's all these sort all these different committees uh, and jurisdictions that are involved in uh, what will be eventually be the regulatory policy that will uh, help blockchain kind of move to the next level. And that's kind of the background education that I'm doing right now. That's awesome. It sounds like you're most literally bridging the divide between Silicon Valley and DC. Um, as you as you've continued this work and, and from everything that you've experienced so far in your current position, what would you say the most compelling use cases for blockchain technology are that's pushing this, this need for policy forward? Uh, I, I think that at least in my eye, the, the promise of smart contracts is probably the, has the most application to various different parts of uh, the economy and potentially could be the biggest headache for regulators and members of Congress. Uh, a lot of the regulations that we have these days are based on the fact that to do something you might, you must go through someone else. And then that someone else can either report what you're doing or uh, flag uh, something suspicious or otherwise just correct, collect, your, collect the information that's required by law into a nice neat package and provide it to either regulators or law enforcement if that's required. Uh, while that's, has worked for the last couple centuries, uh, it's not really applicable if you're operating on a blockchain, which, uh, which enables direct uh, interaction between two parties without the use of a middleman. Uh, so a lot of the regulations that are written right now are, are, are devoted to, or I guess like encumbered with uh, the need to have this uh, kind of centralized entity in the middle uh, and finding a way to integrate blockchain into those existing regulatory regimes while maintaining that things are safe and secure for consumers while not also kind of defeating the whole purpose of blockchain by uh, putting in that middle middleman back into uh, the process and all of the uh, issues and headaches that'll come with that uh, is probably I think the most important challenge and that's what smart contracts I think at their core are all about is kind of is enabling the spread of uh, of these kind of, of this utility across different sectors of the economy. That's fascinating. Uh, so what policy developments have there been within the past five years, if there have been some regarding blockchain and what ones are currently being developed? Yeah, you know, there actually, there has been. And, you know, I think as an industry, sometimes we like to beat up on the government for being slow uh, and not kind of... Uh, uh, addressing some of the needs of the industry, but there have been some, and I think we should uh, give credit where it's due. The, so in 2014 was the kind of the first uh, foray the government took into the cryptocurrency space. It was the IRS uh, who, who kind of set out a policy on taxation um, for what they call convertible virtual currency, um, but what we, we call crypto. Um, and that, that uh, signifies that uh, or deems uh, cryptocurrency to be intangible personal property. Uh, I don't know if we have any tax attorneys on the call today, but depending on the class, the classification uh, with for, for the tax code it also has implications across um, uh, for other use cases too. So that's actually very important. 
um, we're kind of seeing at a, we're at a place now where uh, maybe the one size fits all um, bucket of property isn't quite appropriate um, as blockchain and uh, different uh, digital assets kind of move forward. Uh, so currently, one of the things I'm working on is uh, is a, a more comprehensive tax bill in the Senate. Um, which should be uh, dropping in the next few months um, that kind of address some of those issues. But there's also been um, some activity from different uh, banking regulators like the OCC, the, which is the Office of Control of the Currency, mm -hmm. as well as, um, as Sochi and Andre mentioned, uh, a lot of great work from state regulators around uh, different charters for uh, different uh, crypto companies so they can fit in more neatly into uh, the mm -hmm. existing financial uh, ecosystem so that uh, customers can know that their their funds are safe and sound while also having access to this new technology. That's I'm so excited to see what comes next. So as you continue pushing forward uh, for policy implementation, what roadblocks have you come across? Um, whether it's uh, a fear of tech, you know, from all the sci-fi movies showing AI and tech taking over the world, or even just basic misinformation, a uh, lack of understanding of its importance in our future. Yeah, I think you you hit the nail on the head with uh, with those two. I think the the recent tech lash. Um, has been uh, definitely a factor in some of the reception um, that the cryptocurrency community has gotten uh, within the government. The, uh, I, uh, I joined the Blockchain Association the day before um, Libra was announced. Um, and I think that was a, definitely a seminal moment for, uh, for the industry and its relationship with Washington, D.C., because we were uh, seen as, uh, I guess, a little bit of a distraction before. And then all of a sudden, when this tech behemoth come, uh, came in and express an interest, then it got on people's radar. The, the irony being, of course, that uh, the goals of a lot of our members is to prevent just that sort of kind of uh, tech monopoly from occurring again uh, you know, by, de by decentralizing a lot of these services that some of these traditional tech giants have offered. Um, but then also as well, lack of, lack of understanding. Um, as I think most people are probably aware of from going to the ballot box, most of uh, the members of Congress are a little bit past their, uh, their years of diving headfirst into exciting new technology. Um, and that can cause a little bit of, um, of a, a gap in different educational efforts um, if they're not really uh, kind of up to date on what, for instance, like what open source software is, like what, are, what, what its advantages might are over uh, kind of more traditional software that's owned and operated by just a single entity. The different, uh, like how encryption works, like what, what it allows and what it doesn't allow. Uh, I think these are kind of, these are the obstacles I think I most clearly run into. And then as well as some, as you kind of mentioned, some mis misinformation that's kind of uh, surfaced uh, even more recently in the press as kind of more, as the more mainstream media has taken a greater interest into uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency and kind of is just getting up to speed and uh, it kind of, hasn't maybe spent enough time looking into the actual uh, ecosystem and, and how it works and uh, is, uh, I guess, not quite uh, ready to, to, to join the mainstream conversation. Most definitely. I, I know when I spent some time interning and researching blockchain technology, there was not only a lot of fear around this technology replacing a lot of uh, of these middlemen companies, but also a lot of fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. of un the unfamiliar. Um, for a lot of people who are not directly involved in blockchain, they also feel that this won't even affect them. So how do we, why should we care, I guess, people yeah. who, who aren't directly involved in blockchain, why should we care if our legislators move these policies forward? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's a great question. And I think uh, I'll harken back to something Sochi said earlier, which is that we're really in the early stages of this. And uh, similar to the internet, there's a lot of applications that can be built on top of uh, the existing infrastructure that's being built now that we can't really dream of. So the internet dates back to the 60s um, in its earliest forms, but it wasn't really until the World Wide Web was invented in 1989, or honestly, until broadband was widely available uh, made widely available in the mid 2000s that people really had the opportunity to build those apps that people use every day like Uber or Google or any of these things that we kind of take for granted now. I think like those uh, those use cases would have been uh, not even a glint in people's eyes who had been working on the original DARPA net, uh, you know, back uh, well before uh, there was any sort of 
notion of what an internet could be. And so I, I like to say that, that crypto is still in the dial-up era. The, uh, you know, it, things work there. Uh, you, you can go and try them out yourself, but it's kind of, a, it sometimes can be kind of obnoxiously slow or there, the interface isn't totally clean that you might want to, um, that, that you might be able to kind of figure it out just by sitting down. And those are the things that are like, that people like Andre and Sochi and their, and their companies are working very hard on right now to try to, uh, bring things more into, into the mainstream. So I think the, this kind of this central notion of cutting out the middlemen is such a big game changer as far as offering policies, uh, and products to people. Uh, that has all sorts of applications that can, number one, lower cost. I think it's easy to forget that when you're paying for a product, there's just all sorts of costs that are uh, are stacked on top and included in that price. And the thing that I think is most exciting to me about, uh, about blockchain is this ability to drastically cut some of those costs to the point where different services that might not be feasible to offer um, could all of a sudden be offered. This as a kind of a secondary effect, even if it's not even even if it's doesn't come to mind as directly being uh, you know, like a tech or a finance application. And so I think those sort of that sort of possibility is the main reason why I'm excited about the work that I do, and I think is the reason that people should be excited about this technology in general. Yeah, um, I think like if I could add to that, um, I think like one of the reasons that I got really interested in this space was the ability to democratize wealth and democratize technology. I think especially when we're talking about, you know, big behemoth tech companies. Yeah, I, I grew up in, I, I like to say the shadow of Silicon Valley, predominantly Latino community um, that uh, was very underserved, right? And there was this really interesting dichotomy with like the wealth of Silicon Valley and like what a lot of the, the communities actually were experiencing. And so I think, you know, going back to your question, like why should people care about, you know, legislators and, and regulators and like, and how we're looking at this space, I think this is an opportunity to kind of leapfrog, right? This is an opportunity to really understand and get into the early days, like of a very nascent technology and nascent like financial tools. And what we've seen like throughout history, going back to like, the internet, you know, um, some of the the movements with um, with with social and mobile technology, is that the early early entrants are like rewarded, and so when I speak to my community back home, you know, I encourage them to become educated in this, right, and to have an opinion, and perhaps start to like experiment with it because this this technology is going to be here, and I think it's just so important to to get to get engaged early, right? I. I completely agree. And it's wonderful to hear both of your insight on that as well. I would love to open it up to, to all three of you now and, and just hear your thoughts on, I guess, concerns or excitement in this field. Where do you see the, the field heading now um, that excites you, that you may have uh, the, some hesitations about um, uh, whoever would like to go first? I think I'm really excited about um, uh, and a little frightened as well about NFTs. Um, and I think that the, we're just scratching the surface of like what's available. But I saw one of the questions is like outside of the financial industry, you know, what other industries could benefit? And I, I, I'm going to turn the question like what other like people could benefit as well. And so we've actually seen like artists in the Philippines and in um, and, and Colombia really um, start to find outlets, right, to, um, to, their, to their art. And I think like, for me, blockchain is like, how do you connect people with access to financial tools or, um, and services to people that don't have access? And I, I think like what we've seen emerge with NFTs has really been beautiful. I think looking at some of the stories that have been featured there, um, I think we're still like, again, like really in the early days of NFTs and, um, you know, just trying to understand all of the other use cases, this intersection of NFTs and finance, I think is going to be really fascinating as well was talking to a project and was blown away um, by, you know, what they're offering. Um, and um, it, yeah, it just, it's, I think, you know, we're, we're, um, we're very much like in the early, early days of the NFT space. Yeah. And so for those of you that don't know, I'm sorry, I kind of jumped in at non-fungible token. Yeah. Is what it stands for. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm also really excited about the NFT use case. I think that it has the potential to really improve on a lot of issues that currently exist in the status quo of how social media 
uh, works today. And so, uh, you know, basically, if if you're if you're an Instagram user right now and you upload a photo or a video, you don't actually own any of that content. And to date, people have had to build up large uh, audiences on those platforms and uh, basically try to monetize through sponsorships or advertisements. And so NFTs basically flips that industry on its head and gives artists a way to engage directly with their fan bases um, that, that has some really interesting potential for engagement um, as well as uh, things that weren't previously possible before, like uh, you know, programming royalties directly into an NFT so that an artist can continue to get paid throughout the life cycle of a piece of art that they make. Um, and, and I also think that you know, looking at uh, NFTs, they really are bringing in a different type of uh, audience into uh, this industry, right? So previously it was very technical focused. And so I think it's great that uh, these sorts of use cases uh, exist for more uh, creators and collectors. Let's not forget about them too, right? Uh, digital trading cards have really uh, blown up over the past year. I know I you know, still have my uh, like LeBron card from uh, NBA Top Shot. I was on there <laughs> constantly. Uh, so there's all sorts of fun, fun use cases that really are going to underpin uh, every aspect of uh, society uh, in the future that I'm really excited for. Yeah, absolutely. I think the like it, going further on the theme of kind of like non-financial applications. Like I think the one one of our our member companies who is working on a, a project that I think I'm really excited by excited about is the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Network. The so the in case you aren't familiar, the Filecoin Foundation uh, runs uh, a network that allows anyone to store files remotely and decentralized on uh, a network of unconnected computers. And I think when you take a step back and you look at the way the internet works today, a lot of the internet is run by companies like Amazon with Amazon Web Services. And it's coincidentally how Amazon uh, gets most of their revenue. It's, it's not from delivering you packages or showing you movies. It's by kind of running the modern internet. And I, I think the, the process by which that can be kind of decentralized, taken away from these big internet behemoths and Kind of supported by a group of people all around the world and uh, allow people to have access to data uh, and therefore websites the internet and all this all, all sorts of information um, without having to interact with uh with companies that might not necessarily have their best interests in hearts is a very uh a very exciting development as well thank you for that Ed. In concluding thoughts, I'd love to hear from all of you uh, advice you have for people who want to get involved in this space. Uh, any tips you have for getting your foot in the door if you don't have previous tech experience and, and you're similar to me where you had a foreign policy background or even political science? Yeah, so I can take that one first. Uh, so I think there's really two pieces uh, of advice that, that I would really give there. Uh, and so I imagine a lot of people here have, are coming from more of a policy background, but you know there, there really are opportunities to get involved in so many different uh, applications of this industry, right? So uh, I think most companies are looking from everything from like designers, like graphic designers, web designers, recruiters, salespeople. And so even if you're not technical, uh, there are many ways to, to get involved. And, and the policy side, we, we definitely need more uh, allies, you know, fighting for our cause down in DC. So really, uh, you know, glad for that. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that our industry values proof of work. Uh, it's something that you see over and over again. And so if you are interested in exploring careers in this industry, the easiest way to go about doing that is just to start writing some of your ideas down, you know, blog about what you're learning about and, and your perspectives that you bring from a policy side of things. Um, and if you start, you know, putting that onto Twitter or different platforms um, and it's useful, I think that, uh, you know, you'd be surprised how quickly that can like result in different career opportunities for you. Yeah. 
Um, and happy to add as well. So um, I think there are organizations that serve as like great on ramps. Um, so I am a part of an organization called She 56. 256, uh, and I can put in the the, um, the website for those of you that are interested. They have a really great page that talks about like an introduction um, uh, into blockchain and crypto. It was founded by undergraduate students from um, Cal's blockchain at Berkeley, um, which I'm just always in awe of everybody that comes out of that program. It's been pretty amazing. Um, but they started um, a mentorship program, which has been really great. And so it connects folks that are interested in kind of learning more to folks uh, that are already working in the industry, folks like Andre or myself. Um, you see folks like Tara Tan, really like big names in crypto that are just donating their time um, to really help, you know, help those that other folks that are interested in kind of getting into the space. Um, and then I think another way to kind of engage is there are, you know, a lot of events like this. Uh, there are in-person events. Andre and I were just at Miami Bitcoin, where it's an opportunity to kind of get and Jacob get to learn more about like what's happening in the space. Um, and um, I, I started by volunteering for different projects, right? Uh, to the to the point on proof of work was volunteering for She 56 um, when my baby was like a week old, <laughs> and um, and then also volunteering with um, a group with a project that was started by a group of CS um, PhDs um, out of Stanford, and so that's a great way of kind of getting to know the industry as well, right? Yeah, I think, and I would add that. Don't be afraid if you think you don't know that much about blockchain or crypto or you don't have any experience in, uh, in it. The, uh, as I, I kind of alluded to earlier, I don't know if, if anyone did the math, but uh, you know, like I mentioned that my first day at the Blockchain Association was the day before Libra was announced. That was only two years ago. The, and there's a lot of people in the industry who also don't have much more than a couple or a handful years of experience. So you're not, don't, don't feel like, oh, I don't understand this. I'm so far behind. Like there's... So there's definitely a lot of opportunities um, to to engage, and there's all, or everyone is uh, in the industry is looking for talented people who have a desire to learn and want to make an impact. So, and I guess like uh, I also saw uh, Eric uh, handily posted the uh, our job board link into the into the chat. So I'll definitely make sure to plug that. So the Blockchain Association does run a, a job board with uh, all the openings at our member companies. Uh, last I checked, I think there were about 2,600 job listings posted on there right now. Uh, so the industry is definitely hiring. And I would highly encourage anyone who is interested in joining the industry to, to take a look at that and see if there's a job that looks appealing to you. So I'd like to officially open everything up now to q and I've noticed several questions coming in regarding uh, you know, severe fluctuation of pricing between different uh, cryptocurrencies. And I feel that this largely comes from perhaps buyers viewing this more as a commodity rather than a currency to be exchanged. Um, I'd love to, to, this is my question, by the way, for the q and I'd love to, to hear from all of you um, how we can combat this so that the, the, it doesn't fluctuate so severely in price from people just viewing this as another fad or, or notch to add into their belt. Um, yeah, um, I, I can get started. So I think, um, I think because the, it is a volatile asset, right? I think, you know, we are going to see with the market ups and downs. Um, and, um, and so I think there's that aspect of it. But what we also see, you know, there's a need for kind of utility. Um, and, um, and we see stable coins like at Celo, I, I put this in the chat, um, we launched a Celo dollar, which um, is um, is basically a currency that is pegged to the the U.S. dollar. Um, um, it, it, it's based on um, um, uh, uh, on an algorithm, and we have a stablecoin also launched that is um, that is uh, based on this, uh, the euro, so a cello euro in place as well. And so I think that like depending on like the use case, right? Um, stable coins may be more um, maybe more applicable, right? Especially when when you want it to kind of retain, retain that value. Um, and we see that come up a, a lot, right. When we are talking to different, um, 
different organizations that are interested, like the Grameen Foundation. We did some work recently with them to provide COVID aid relief. You could imagine that sending a volatile asset would be like difficult, right? And so we were able to kind of send CUSD directly to the uh, to the phones of some of the beneficiaries, um, and that that really opened up a lot of doors. It it retained its value, right? Um, and they were able to make purchases um, directly through their phones in a in a way that would have been sent like you know with uh, like medical supplies or, um, or 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 food supplies, right? As well. Andrew, uh, Andre or Jacob, would you like to uh, jump in? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I do think that the, the I, I saw there was definitely uh, questions kind of in the chat alluding to this uh, as well. Um, and it's definitely an, an interesting topic. The I do believe that there will be less volatility in the cryptocurrency market going forward as uh, more and more people adopt it. Uh, however, uh, as kind of, as Sochi pointed out, there are also great solutions to, to mitigate that volatility, like CUSD uh, and other stable coins um, that are specifically designed uh, to have a nice uh, and easy and predictable uh, store of value that's linked to uh, whatever country you're living in's currency. So I, I think that there's a lot more to uh, be seen on that front um, as far as uh, getting those uh, financial instru instruments more integrated into the economy. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. I, I don't have like too much to add on this topic other than the fact that I think that um, likely we're, we're, it's it's likely that the result of this will be some sort of hybrid based system where you have like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum sort of serving as like the base layer sort of store of value and then currencies uh, on top of that will be used to uh, transact for everyday goods and services. So. Uh, CBDCs are definitely, um, you know, in sort of like experimental phase right now, but like definitely coming down the pipeline, which may provide a more stable unit of account in whatever you know country that you're transacting on for, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue to see that volatility decrease as more sophisticated institutions get involved in the industry. Uh, another uh, important challenge to like more mainstream payment adoption that that I want to touch on also is the something that Jacob mentioned previously around this idea that cryptocurrency is property. And so today, if you wanted to use uh, your Bitcoin or Zcash for mainstream payments, uh, you would have to calculate a capital gains tax uh, for like, you know, buying coffee and, and things like that. And so, you know, hopefully some of these reg regulatory uh, proposals, like the one that Jacob is, is working on, can help to address some of these issues uh, to actually help make crypto a, a viable method of payment in the future. Yeah, I think one other point that we didn't touch on, and perhaps because like we're based in the United States, is that you know oftentimes we've seen like Bitcoin and Ethereum um, really take off in countries where they had devaluation of their currency or they had much, they weren't able to retain that right, and so I think that's like an important aspect of 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 this as well is that you know we take for granted that kind of I think where we are, but there are other countries around the world that have like you know, more severe problems with their own local currency, right? And I think, you know, being able to provide access to, uh, again, like it goes back to the censorship resistance of like Bitcoin um, and uh, Ethereum, but also like really being able to look at, you know, um, products that are stable coins like CUSD and others, I think really kind of help address some of the challenges that other folks face. Okay. I see a question here in the chat that I would love to allow the, the participant to ask. Um, I believe their name is pronounced Haniye. Are you still on the call? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, awesome. So I'd love for you to ask uh, the panelists your question. Yes, so basically it's about the prices as we see like for example for Bitcoin or Ethereum that uh, they got to their peak, uh, Bitcoin got to like $65,000 and then it had a huge drop. So, and now like governments and like corporations are considering this to have, uh, to invest or uh, to have it as part of their payments, I would say, or like even some banks that are trying to like accept that as part of their official payments. So what I'm trying to understand is that in future, if this becomes more, uh, popular will the prices will the prices be more stable 
So like all these like uh, ups and downs will be more stable. Yeah, you know, I, I basically think that you can think of like Bitcoin and uh, any other sort of like early stage cryptocurrency, uh, almost like a like early stage sort of like startup or venture investment that goes through sort of like very volatile periods, uh, like throughout its uh, growth trajectory. And so, you know, when you look at the data, uh, Bitcoin has something like 200 percent compa compounded growth rate since inception. And so it's actually well, while it's volatile, it's um, you know, historically done. Uh, you know, quite well over the, over those time periods. Uh, but I think like, you know, again, we're only 10 years in to this industry. And so, um, you know, as more of these products develop, more institutions get involved. Uh, I do think that over time, we'll start to see that volatility start to damp damp dampen. Yeah. And we're starting to see that institutional, right. Um, um, with, uh, companies starting to like hold crypto on their balance sheets. Right. Um, I think it's been like a real great, um, great story of like it kind of getting to be more mainstream. Um, Deutsche Telekom, um, also just joined the Alliance for Prosperity, um, which is an organization that we have, where we bring together um, companies that are like-minded um, and really want to um, to to develop an open financial system, right? That that benefits all. Um, and so I think that like now, what's really great is like with this institutional adoption is like I think we're going to continue to see like more awareness um, and more accessibility of this, right? All right, thank you. So I believe there was one more question in the chat. If the panel participants have time, I know we're going a bit over time. Um, sure, happy to stay. Okay, awesome. So I believe their name is Jason Gonzalez. Um, are you still on the call? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay, awesome. Um, so Jason had a question regarding how many different uh, uh, jobs I guess, uh, would would be influenced by blockchain technology, but I'll let him elaborate a little further. Yeah, so my original question was around, um, you know, what are some of the industries that might be able to use blockchain? Sochi, you, you kindly uh, answered that question, but as a follow-up, what do you think are some of the more uh, emerging industries that can come from using blockchain and that type of technology, something that's not so mainstream right now, like the financial markets and things like that and financial sectors? Yeah, uh, uh, so, sorry, go ahead, Andres. Uh, all I was going to really add in, uh, you know, to, to answer this question was that, you know, I really think that, uh, you know, blockchain technology is going to uh, ultimately underpin uh, many different aspects of uh, our current society. And so, you know, I think that, like, the way I think about this question, it, it, it was kind of like asking, you know, uh, how would uh, mobile uh, what industries would like a mobile phone uh, impact, you know, over the next you know decade or so? And, and you know, the answer is that ultimately every company is going to have to adopt a strategy for how to deal with blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. Yeah, uh, I'll just add that, like, I think the best way to to think about maybe like what what industries kind of might be first in um, in adopting uh, blockchain is is to think about what uh, what requires you to know for sure that what you're what you're holding is authentic and like in and is what you need so there's all sorts of even you know like obviously my area of expertise is the government so things that come to mind are things like titles to your house or your car or um other sort of anything that needs to be uh any sort of document that needs to be certified um that so that you know for sure that the document is from the the source that someone claims it is um, in the past, we rely on an entity like a government to have a seal of approval or some sort of stamp that says that uh, that document is valid. But with blockchain, you can verify that electronically, uh, and that creates a whole lot of uh, red tape. I'm mean, sorry, that eliminates a whole lot of red tape um, and time that would normally be taken to get some of these things uh, accomplished. Yeah. And I think just to add, if you're curious, um, there are, again, like blockchain at Berkeley has done like a phenomenal job of showcasing different industry use cases. So 
automotive industry, the agriculture industry as well. So I definitely encourage you to kind of check that out. But I, I think the analogy with mobile is a great one. I mean, not to date myself, but like, you know, like think about like the old phones, like the flip phones and like how, um, you know, how much that has evolved and now how much you can do on your phone. That's kind of what we're talking about with the scale of blockchain. Yeah. So I would love to thank you all for coming today and, and taking the time to sit down and, and talk through all these use cases, policy applications, the obstructions, and, and answer questions from students. It was incredibly valuable also to me to, to be briefed again on blockchain and um, the, the developments in the field. Um, if I could, I'd love to hear just one closing remark from each of you of what you feel is uh, something that that blockchain is going to most greatly impact uh, with, within, uh, I guess, like the next five to 10 years that we should be looking at, um, whether it's, uh, you know, how to uplift um, certain communities or, or even how drastically it'll change the, the financial sector. Yeah, I just I go back to this democratization of wealth and technology. Um, and, you know, I think that's what motivated me, um, you know, to to join this industry. And I would, you know, kind of pose this as a call to action to everybody that's on the phone uh, or uh, on, on the on the video chat here is to kind of learn, learn more about the space, like get curious um, I think attending like events like this is a great first step, but this is really, again, like the opportunity to get to, to be in the forefront. Um, and so I would, I would leave everybody with that. Yeah, t totally agree. Um, you know, one thing that I'll add is that, you know, I, I've talked about this idea that, you know, blockchain is really going to, you know, underpin parts, uh, like all parts of society. Like, I think that we're going to see the tokenization of many different use cases. And so, you know, within the next five years, I think that we'll start to transition to like predominantly digital blockchain-based payments for uh, everyday goods and services and start to phase out, you know, like physical, uh, like cash payments for many things. We'll start to see the tokenization of all sorts of financial assets. So stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities will all likely be tradable on a blockchain. Um, and so, you know, once you start to you know, recognize that this technology is going to reshape many of the ways that we interact with each other and with our institutions, um, I think that like you want to start to take steps to get involved and become educated. And, you know, some of the, the like last thing that, you know, I think about are like, how can we use that to, again, to really increase access for people who have historically been excluded uh, from the financial system, uh, how can we make sure that this the, the benefits of this technology don't just accrue to the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, but are really uh, meant to to move society forward and, and benefit? Uh, to to Sochi's point, uh, really democratize access for all. Um, and so, you know, yeah, th thank you all for coming to today's conversation. It's been a blast and um, I'll drop my contact information in the chat if, if you all want to stay in touch afterwards. Yeah, uh, I guess for me, I will kind of elaborate on something that Andre mentioned um, earlier in regard to NFTs with, um, with royalties uh, and getting content creators paid. The, I think, uh, the ability to, to leverage smart contracts to, in order to automatically pay people whenever something is uh, whenever something is transferred will have a big impact on people who are participating in the creative economy and otherwise might never see the fruit of their work be realized if they created a piece of art or any other sort of any other thing that could be you know of value to someone um, years ago and then no longer ha own it anymore. Uh, the ability to have that kind of knowledge that you're going to have that revenue stream will also enable lower prices up front potentially to enable more people to experience and enjoy some of these creations as well. So that's something that I think is going to be really good for, uh, for creatives and other people who might uh, not have the ability or I guess the belief that they'd be able to monetize their, um, their dreams and aspirations and might be able to do so in the future. What inspiring closing remarks. Uh, 
thank you again for, for coming to speak to us today. I had a blast being your moderator. Um, if anyone within the panel um, or even within the participants would like to reach out to me to um, I'm happy to provide my, my contact information as well. Just shoot me a message on LinkedIn. Carolina Ramos, you should see FIU affiliation pop up as one of the first things in my profile. Um, thank you again uh, to the panel, to the participants for tuning in to such an amazing call. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.